All right, so what we're going to do for these uh, kind of series of, of meditations is we're going to sing verses from hymn 431. So just go ahead and leave that hymnal open in between each of the meditations, and we're going to come back to it for the next verse that follows. So we'll just start by singing the first verse, first stanza from hymn 431, I Walk in Danger All the Way. You are just given victory in a contest. You normally have to, some way, shape, or form, work for it. No sacrifice, no victory. Well, what victory do we want? What victory are we afraid of not having? It's not talking about soldiers being deployed in Afghanistan. It's talking about a spiritual battle, spiritual war, one that's waged every single day, one that's being waged right now as I speak, as you listen, as you worship, and you are engaged in it. There are no bystanders in this war. You are either on one side or you're on the other. There is no neutral. It's between God and between the devil and actually all forces of evil in this world. Anything that is not God and is not perfection. We normally think of three distinct enemies. We think of the devil himself, the one who used to be an angel, who used to know what it was like to be perfect, but then rebelled against God, and now has made it his, his goal to destroy every last one of us. And not just destroy, no, he wants us to suffer for all eternity. He doesn't want us to have an ounce of relief. He wants us to be in pain and in torment as he is. And he will lie, he will cheat, he will do anything he can possibly do to make us lose this battle. There is also the enemy of the world. People who look at us and say, why do you bother with this God that you have? Why do you bother reading that ancient book that's dusty and outdated and has nothing to do with us? They want us simply to lay down arms, join the other side, come over here. We, we know what we're talking about. We're on the winning side. Why don't you just give up? And then there's the enemy of ourselves. The voice inside of our head that actually listens to the enemies. It says, you know, I, I don't want to be on the losing side. I don't want to be on that prospect. And when you look at this world, it, am, are we losing? Am I going to lose if I stay this course? Maybe I should give up. Maybe I should switch sides. And so the battle rages, and it continues. And the war continues to try to, to separate us from God. And there is no draft dodging. You, you just simply cannot stay out of the conflict. But for us gathering here today, we're coming as soldiers of the cross. We have already said that we are aligned to God. 
and to what he has said. As Christians, we have a leader. We have a general who does something not like other generals. He's not just a general who can give good speeches and say pithy sayings and really inspire and invigorate us. He is a general who is going to be out on the front lines of the battle. He's not going to stay, play it safe and stay somewhere in the rear in some armored bunker somewhere. But no, he's going to be the first one to clash steel with the enemy, to meet them head on and engage them. And when he does so, he cries out a rallying cry to tell us to follow after him into battle, to follow him into what he says, this is going to be victory. That is the general we have. The same one proclaimed in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 13. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. We sing the next stanza of hymn 431. experiment, create this super soldier, and he's really running down this 90-pound asthmatic Steve Rogers kid. Why would you possibly choose him? Why would he be your leading candidate for this project? Why don't you pick this other guy? He's big, he's bulky, he's strong, he follows orders, he's good. <clears throat> to which the doctor says he's a bully. And the colonel kind of snarls at him. You don't win wars with niceness, doctor. Reaches over, grabs a dummy grenade, pulls the pin, says, you win war with guts, throws it into this crowd of training troops. Everyone scatters, tries to save themselves, but it's that 90-pound asthmatic Steve Rogers who jumps on the grenade. Is there a more noble sacrifice than to give up your life to save others? These are people we remember. These are people that, what more can you say? They gave their life so that others could live. Whereas how many of us would hear grenade and jump out of the way, try to run and find cover? Because you would just do self-preservation. That makes sense. But the greatest love is the one that's willing to sacrifice everything for someone else. Love is about what you do for another person. Not just what they do for you, not how you feel about them. It's what you do for them. <laughs> what you're willing to do for them. What you're willing to sacrifice and give up for them. It's that kind of love that our general has. The love that Jesus Christ teaches to his disciples. He actually set out to jump on the grenade to die. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We sing stanza three of hymn 431.
service, I mean, wouldn't you want to follow somebody like that in the battle? To know that they care more about your life than their own. There's a lot of ways you can nobly sacrifice your life. Thinking about one particular group of people in World War II, they were called kamikazes. These pilots knew that their side was losing, but yet they wanted to do a little bit more. They wanted to inflict more damage and possibly turn the tide, and so for a more targeted <coughs> and more explosive way of enacting war, they strapped explosives onto their planes and they piloted them right into Allied battleships and aircraft carriers. It was effective, but it required sacrifice. Total sacrifice. That was a good one shot and you were done. These people were honored. The kamikazes were honored. They were told that they were giving a noble sacrifice for their nation, for their family. They would be remembered well. They'd be heroes. Maybe for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. Maybe for a noble cause. Maybe for, for glory in the eternal. Maybe I can give up my life. But what if your country doesn't love you? What if your people want nothing to do with you? What if the people who are supposed to be your allies and your comrades are actually your enemies? What if they hate you? Would you still give your life in service to them? Would you still jump on the grenade for those kind of people? People who would just as, as soon stab you in the back than support you in battle. Such is the condition when Jesus comes into the world. We're told that the sinful mind is hostile to God, does not submit to his law, nor can it do so, that we are actually enemies of God. We don't want to follow him. We don't want to be on his side. We actually try to subvert him. Actually try collaborating with the enemy cause him to lose. All of us came into this world that way. And some of us even, we still wrestle while this war is going on about what to do and sometimes we help our enemy more than we fight against him. But that didn't stop Jesus from following through on what he was going to do. It wasn't going to stop him from following through on his mission. He was going to sacrifice himself, and he was going to do it even for people who didn't want him to do it, even for people who didn't even want to be associated with him. He sacrificed for us. That's what Paul explains in Romans chapter 8, or Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. We sing stanza four of hymn 431. <laughs>
die for us. And when you think about someone to follow, it is comforting to know they would give everything for us. It makes us want to fight for them. Even the kamikazes, they're, they're commendable things about that trait. I will die so that my country might possibly succeed. But if every general were a kamikaze, who would lead us into battle? If every general jumped on a grenade, there would be no one left to lead. When you die, you're dead. You're gone. You're done. If that was our general every time, we would have no one to follow, no one to lead us. That's what makes our general and his sacrifice so unique. One that no one else could have done. Deciding to love a country that did not love him, deciding to love a people who wanted nothing to do with him, loving comrades in arms who actually fought against him, not only did he decide to give up his life for these people, for us, but he said, I will take my life back up again. I won't just fall on the grenade. I won't just willingly charge into the front lines and possibly die fighting for you. But I know I will die. And in fact, I will come back to life. No one can take this life from me. That's what makes our Jesus and his sacrifice completely different from any other sacrifice that has ever been made for the sake of people, for country, for a nation. He sacrifices to come back to us, to continue to lead us, to still be our general. That's what he tells us from John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. Jesus says, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. We sing stanza five of hymn 431. <laughs> sacrificed himself for us, only to take his life back up again. But there's been many casualties on the other side as well. Those who have died fighting against us, trying to get us to give up and surrender, to raise the white flag, and just give in to sin, give in to the devil, give in to anything but God. Our general made that great sacrifice. Our Jesus gave up his life not so that we would wallow in sorrow. That we would have cemeteries filled with graves. But actually he did it so that death would be defeated finally and totally. That life would exist beyond the days we have upon this earth. That with all the tears of sadness that we have, all the mourning of loss, of all those who have sacrificed themselves, even in the name of our freedoms that we enjoy, so that we can be here today. Our Lord died so that they could live forever. So that death would be conquered for them, so that death would be conquered for us. Ultimately, that's what the greatest soldier, the greatest general, has done. That is what our Lord and Savior has done for us by laying down his life purposefully. 
only to take it back up again. Death is conquered. By Jesus' sacrifice, we have victory. Victory over death. Victory for a life that is waiting for us in heaven, a life everlasting, a life that doesn't end. That is what his sacrifice accomplished, not something self-serving, not something that happened when all other options were exhausted, but something he purposefully chose to do so that we would never speak of death again. That's the words given to us at the end of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. John records, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so we say, Amen. Jesus' sacrifice is our victory. Amen. We sing hymn 431, the last stanza, stanza 6. Mm -hmm.